Okay, so in this audio, we're just going to wrap up the stuff that we didn't get to cover in class when we did kind of a marathon run through various critical theorists. So last time we talked about Adorno, a bit of his backstory, Marcuse, backstory as well, and a lot of their collaboration um, through the Institute for Social Research or the Frankfurt School. And of course, um, Horkheimer and his impact as well. We talked about their you know, influences and core ideas. And then we explored these arguments of why did the revolution not happen in the way that Marx had predicted it. So we talked a lot about, you know, kind of reminding us about some of the stuff we talked about with Marx before, and then how they challenged or how they looked at these kind of things differently is as, you know, neo-Marxists. And then um, we went through all of these different terminologies and perspectives, and then we ended up somewhere in here. So we talked about, you know, repression as part of society. We talked about, you know, the pleasure principle, the idea that there's this drive to get, you know, gratification of desires, and that to be in society, you have to supplant some of that. So, you know, we talked about their kind of meshing of these classical theories in sociology with a psychological approach through Freud. And I think we left off somewhere around free time, this area, right? We talked about surplus repression. We left off there. Marcuse saying that um, some of the repression that we have in society exceeds how much is needed to maintain human survival and instead is there to preserve social domination. So free time, in his perspective, it should be something that, you know, um, you use to better yourself, right? So the lifeblood of the culture industry is filling people's leisure time with standardized conformist commodities, including information. So more than this, leisure is controlled by the very length of the working day and the nature of the dulled mechanized work experience from their perspective. So it takes time to learn new things and reflect on ourselves and do that inner work right, or to learn to get into, let's say, even just to like get into a new, new uh, music genre or learn a new skill or a hobby. Instead, the culture industry throws us 50 more Marvel movies a year, which of course I'll watch, right? But for some reason, <laughs> these are an escape that help people not reflect or not question the status quo and never break past that false consciousness that they're saying is coming from the culture itself. So, um, also, when it comes to the pleasure principle and understanding how people are controlled, they also talked about sexual instincts. The idea that, you know, people through part of the indoctrination process into a repressed social order, that individuals have to be desexualized. So their sexual energies have to be focused on things like love in order to sustain a monogamous patriarchal family structure. So those are the things that are promoted through the culture industry. Those are the things that, you know, people internalize as, you know, the correct way to be. So repressive desublimation is pretty interesting as well. So institutionalized desublimation is managed by a con controlled liberalization, which increases satisfaction with the offerings of society. So repressive desublimation is limiting the antagonism between the culture and the social reality through the obliteration of oppositional elements of higher culture. So for example, what if all advertising and all media indoctrination and all kind of, you know, fluff entertainment just stopped tomorrow, it was gone, then the individual would plunge into a traumatic void where they'd have the, the chance to wonder and think and challenge what they know and get to know themselves. Okay. So moving into Adorno and Marcuse's theoretical orientations. So their views are based on a distinction between, you know, critical theorist views as of the world of, of what it is versus what it should be. In their view, social order is maintained as individuals have these needs and desires they need met and society allows for certain goals or aspirations that they determine to be appropriate for people to channel those feelings into. So it becomes a part of the individual's own consciousness and their autonomous capacity for reason. So reducing individuality to nonsensical compliance for the demand to fit in and follow orders, whether it be from 
a boss, from a parent, from a neighbor, from advertisers, right? They say, you know, controls a lot of our experiences in life and the totality of life is filtered through some of these, um, you know, controls. They challenge this positivist technological rationality because they say it's not capable of providing an objectively meaningful source of human purpose. So you can have lots of calculations and reports and statistical findings, but, you know, individuals are not just motivated to pursue efficiency, for example, right? that there's a lot of things that impact them and, and their choices. So above all else, you know, um, they're not going to choose like efficiency and say, well, I was coldly calculable and therefore <laughs> this is right. Unless they say that, you know, society affects their consciousness as to basically affect their ability to determine what the purpose of their actions should be and simply do the actions because those are the actions that one is supposed to do. So this is where they're arguing that it becomes its own kind of totalitarianism. The technological rationality, instead of freeing us from the barbarism of the past, um, you know, that was supposed to come through with the Enlightenment, that instead it ushered in this kind of almost its own thoughtlessness where now people just obey what the rule is because it's the rule instead of thinking freely to determine what purpose or, you know, what reason they would want to set or maybe change or modify that particular rule. So it creates its own totalitarian system that controls a lot of thought and then, of course, a lot of action. Okay, so going on to Habermas. Okay, brief bio here. Um, just going to go through a little bit. It's all in the chapter, so we'll just kind of touch on it here a little bit. Um, so Habermas is another one of those dudes who is out there, um, you know, talking about a lot of these philosophies that cha that were challenging the status quo and some of the settled or accepted belief systems of the time. So obviously that's usually not very popular, <laughs> right? He um, really was inspired by... Um, German idealist philosophers like Schelling and others, and he was disillusioned by some of the early critical theorists. The idea that the public sphere of debate, you know, um, kind of rejecting that as arena for democratic progressive change, and the fact that they saw modern society as very disparaging in general. So he had a little bit of a challenge to that, as we'll talk about in a moment. So um, between 1971 and 1981, um, he wrote several works that were highly acclaimed, including Knowledge and Human Interests and Legitimation Crisis. Um, in 1980, he won the Adorno Prize from the city of Frankfurt. <clears throat> and in 1982, he was, he was named Extraordinary Professor of Philosophy in Heidelberg. So he was considered one of Europe's most important public intellectuals and described by Der Spiegel magazine as the most intellectually powerful philosopher in Germany. And we're still talking about this guy. Okay, so <laughs> um, some of the influences and core ideas on, you know, his developing ideology. So German Enlightenment thinkers were a big impact here. So he incorporated the insights of Kant, Hegel, and Marx, which we've talked about, and fashioned a contemporary approach to, you know, again, trying to look at social philosophy as more of a project towards emancipation, right? That it's not just about figuring out how we think, but how do we make people free? So some of the themes that form the core of his theoretical perspective, again, in addition to Marxist-inspired folks, he incorporates a lot of different scholars, including Weber, Durkheim, Mead, Parsons, linguistic philosophers, developmental psychologists, all sorts of stuff, like throws in, throws a bunch of stuff against the wall, and <laughs> it all comes together in this perspective. Earlier critical theorists saw rationalization leading only to the corruption of the human spirit and decay of civilization. And while it's true that, you know, <laughs> the possibility for democracy and human emancipation have been affected by how they've actually played out in modern society, modernity has also brought some good things that we can take for granted if we're looking at them just in a very um, 
you know, kind of, or at least the way he's saying that the early critical theorists were being a little too harsh, right? So he said, you know, with modernity, we got the rule of law, we got expansion of political and civil rights, and maybe obviously not the full realization of democracy, <laughs> but um, at least a lot more democratic principles of government, right, come out of this time period. So rationalizing processes have led to advances in a variety of fields from medical science like if you think about how much longer people live now to things like food production to be more efficient to produce more food to architecture i mean now we can build buildings to withstand some of these you know um weather issues that we're now getting more and more of <laughs> due to climate change due to human impact <laughs> that's also modernity but anyway um you know the arts all of these things have led to advances throughout so Habermas holds out this great hope for the power of reason to combat the dehumanizing consequences that stem from the rationalization of society he's really rekindling this utopian vision and it's not quite what marx said like they're going to throw off their chains and etc but he does also circle back to look at capitalism as a primary cause of humans you know um issues when it comes to you know equity and liberty and freedom but um <clears throat> you know he's not looking at it in the way that marx <laughs> was saying you know people have to uproot this capitalistic stuff and overthrow it and he's saying well yeah we have to check the issues that do stem from the rationalization of society that cause problems so according to Habermas, it's not the form of economic or material production of society or the relationship between individuals and their physical environment, but it's the form of its symbolic rep reproduction. So the processes of socialization, of identity formation, social integration, those kind of things that actually pose the greatest threat to freedom and progress in modern society. Right. It's how it's what we it's not just the economy itself. It's what we teach people about each other through socialization. It's identity formation in an unequal society, right? Anyway, so he gets into this in what he calls the life world in systems. Okay, so life world, okay, this is <laughs> it's a little bit complicated, so hopefully I can make this make sense. So Habermas conceives of the life world as a pre-reflexive framework of background assumptions. So just a network of shared meanings that people draw from to construct their identities or to negotiate situational definitions, right? Like when you're in a situation and you need to kind of understand what's happening, <laughs> right? You often look to others in that space to see how they're acting to then pair your own actions to them, right? And also the life world is a place in which to create social solidarity. So it's where you live your life freely and the life world is split into the private and the public sphere where you can freely act or discuss. And then um, the system, which we'll talk about in a moment, different from the life world, is more like the macro that can colonize the micro of the life world. So we'll get there in a second. So uh, disturbances to the life world appear when novel situations arise that can't readily be interpreted through existing knowledge. Those kind of disturbances can lead to a loss of meaning as the cultural know-how proves inadequate to providing an understanding of the new circumstances, right? So it's interesting, in our lives, we're often in spaces that make sense to us, social spaces, like you go into a classroom, you know what your role is, you know what you're supposed to do, right? But we also have sometimes these more ambiguous situations, right? Or, you know, spaces that we travel through. And it's, you know, just knowing about the culture and the expectations of what we already know is not enough to understand these particular situations. So social solidarity among society's members can really be threatened as the rules that regulate social relations and the coordinations of actions are called into question. Because this can lead to, you know, he, he's building here off of the work on suicide you know, that talked about the development of weak social integration or anime and how that can lead to a lot of problems in society. The individuals can have psychopathologies and the alienation that they experience, especially through a socialization process, is less likely to reproduce someone that's a responsible adult that can cope with new conditions. And that leads them in a situation where they're ne gonna neglect their social obligations and pursue defensive strategies, quote, detrimental to participating in social interaction on a realistic basis, end quote. So rationalization of the life world 
produces the potential to question our actions and the actions of others, and to question more generally the conditions of the world around us. This potential is itself made possible by the discourses regarding truth, goodness, and beauty, and are differentiated into separate spheres of knowledge with its own focal concern. In the process, highly abstract concepts like democracy, equality, freedom, universal rights, are able to circulate in civic debate in the public sphere, and then in turn that creates the conditions for consensual understanding of those forces that shape social life. So according to Habermas, Marx and his successors failed to recognize the significance of the symbolic and the communicative domains of society, opting instead to emphasize on the role of economic production or property relations when they were trying to explain the social order. To Habermas, the system comprises a society's political and economic structures that are responsible for the organization of power relations and the production and distribution of material resources. As societies evolve, both the state and the economy develop their own formal structure and mechanisms for self-organization. Habermas called these organizational mechanisms steering media and argued that two primary forms emerge, power and money. So the relationships between the life world and the system represents a crucial dynamic shaping the development of human society. Although the system has its origins in the life world, highly differentiated and complex societies have developed a set of emergent structures that become increasingly segmented from the communicative and integrative processes that are happening as people interact and talk within the life world. So in smaller and less differentiated societies, the system and the life world are closely coupled in a tight mutual interrelationship. But over time, as earlier societies were confronted with population increases or contacts with other societies, or things like pressure on resources, because there's more people, there's more resources, this, they need more resources, right? This required the development of new methods for solving new problems. So Habermas's colonization of the life world is the process in which the system steering media, that money and power, and the technical or instrumental logic that come to replace those consensual negotiations of shared meanings that people have in the life world as that foundation for our social integration and the reproduction of society in that life world. So the colonization of the life world is manifested through an individual's relation to the system in their roles as you know, legal citizens or clients of the state and of course as workers and consumers. So while one's position or status in society is no longer solely ascribed by custom and kinship relations, right, to the extent that the state or power and the economy or money can shape social relations, they do so without the benefit of negotiated consensual understandings of their impact on individuals in the broader society. So basically, money talks, money begets power, and power begets action, right? And this is being done not from the life world of people in their homes and in their communities or in pubs or or coffee houses talking about politics or contending with these issues that it's really coming from those other steering media right the money and the power that are then having an impact on you know what what kind of social relations there are in society instead of from the people themselves so that's why he calls it kind of a colonization. It's as if that larger system, and specifically the steering media, is controlling or dominating the life world. So states seek to avoid or mitigate legitimation crises by providing their clients, or you know, citizens, with material rewards in the form of social programs. So while it's in the interest of all government officials to secure the obedience of the citizenry, Efforts to expand healthcare coverage, nevertheless, continued to be opposed by many members of Congress in our country, right? As well as by an entire health insurance industry that would lose billions of dollars in profit if a wholesale overhaul of the system, you know, such as enacting a single payer universal healthcare system or a public health insurance option, you know, like some of those kind of Medicare for all things that have been 
promoted by people like Bernie Sanders, you know, if, if something like that was enacted, that would really challenge the power and the money that comes from that health insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, all of these other kind of, you know, systems that um, make power and, you know, gain money through those particular interactions, right? So it kind of makes sense. Like, if you want citizens to love America more, it'd be kind of nice if America would just be like, here's some health insurance, <laughs> right? Especially when we understand that we're very different. Well, actually, most Americans don't understand that that in pretty much any other developed country, there is some access to either single payer universal care or public health insurance options that make insurance much, 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 much more affordable or even free in some cases, um, you know, through whether it's, you know, through their tax systems, through other systems, basically not to get too complicated into the institutions of healthcare at this moment, but the idea being that you're going to get a citizenry of people who are really going to um, come to value that larger system if that system is providing something for them. So, for instance, if the system is providing protection from, you know, let's say dangerous chemicals in the form of environmental protection, um, if it's if that system is providing, you know, um, again, healthcare resources or resources for children for them to thrive or things of this nature, then obviously that's going to connect people with that system. But um, ironically, I think that's part of the problem of like, why do so many people understand that the system in our society, you know, is often rigged towards those that, again, that steering media, those who have power, those who have money. Um, because yeah, if they just kind of throw us a couple things here and there, they could mitigate some of that problem. <laughs> okay, so moving on to faith and reason, or the public sphere and new social movements. So again, the public sphere is composed of an array of social spaces where private individuals can publicly congregate and freely talk about or debate political, ethical, and social issues in a non-coercive and undistorted manner. So the public sphere is not an institution. It's not an organization. It's not a system. It just is. It's just like a place people go to, <laughs> a thing people do when they chat with each other. So the public sphere is differentiated into levels according to the density of communication and the organizational complexity. So you have episodic publics, which are found in taverns, coffee houses, or just like on streets, you know, corners, stuff like that. Um, you have occasional public spheres or arranged publics. And these are of particular presentations and events, such as a theater performance or a rock concert, maybe a political party assembly coming together, or like, you know, um, religious or church services. And then there's the abstract public sphere of isolated readers, listeners, and viewers that are scattered across large geographic areas or even around the globe and brought together only through mass media. So Habermas, you know, obviously from the time period he was developing these, these um, perspectives, he wasn't thinking of social media because that's such a modern concept, but I still think that fits within his concept of the abstract public sphere because it is still a way in which people are scattered all across large geographic areas um, and brought together through media, right? Through maybe these apps or things like that. So some of the criticisms of... Habermas's, um, you know, kind of viewpoint is that it's overly idyllic, that Habermas maintains the potential for creating a truly democratic society is based on that universal reason, right, that that's what we want, that we can get that if, you know, we use the public sphere's domain as the place in which to develop what it means to be truly democratic. So he notes that the public sphere of open debate was deformed by the scale of its growth over the past century and by the rationalization of economic and political institutions whose technical requirements and forms of rationality have really seeped into the public sphere. So with the extension of democratic rights, more citizens demanded inclusion in the public sphere and the resulting structural transformation impeded its own rational development. Central issues relating to democratic governance were increasingly defined in terms of efficiency and productivity, as a growing number of individuals were awarded the right to participate in decision-making in an environment 
that is marked by growing social, political, and economic complexities. So Habermas contended that the space for open democratic public discussion was limited to the extent that resources like money and power interfere in the process of opinion formation. So public debates have become all too infrequent, right? Because in the face of political and economic processes that can often seem outside of our control, we recognize the limitations of the efficiency of people standing on a street corner talking about stuff or going to a, a you know coffee shop and having a chat, right? And so the result is the public sphere that was idealized by Habermas has really been deformed, making it all the more essential to reconstruct the vision of emancipatory project that began with the Enlightenment. So new social movements are composed of an array of groups whose disparate aims are united by the critique of growth they emerge from the margins of established economic and political structures and give voice to what he calls crisis consciousness that calls attention to the social and environmental pathologies created in the wake of advanced industrial capitalism. And again, pathology is just meaning like literally almost diseases, <laughs> the social and environmental you know, consequences of industrial capitalism. So these movements are potentially effective avenues for invigorating public sphere because they're injecting claims into the political process that are largely peripheral to the interests of bureaucratic political organizations and their leaders, right? So if you think about some of these movements, like, for instance, um, you have the Fridays for Future, you know, led by Greta Thunberg, uh, kind of movement of young people trying to get, um, you know, all of these state institutions around the world to really do something about the impending climate crisis, right? So they're obviously coming from a largely peripheral, it meaning uh, teenage girls are not usually the core of politics and power in society, right? But this girl was just basically like, you know, decided I'm gonna start protesting every Friday, not go to school, instead I'm gonna start this protest and it actually became like a worldwide phenomenon at this point, right? So you can see how when someone like Greta stands up and says, how dare you to these political leaders, she's really bringing in a lot of new ideas or in his view, injecting different claims into the political process that are largely going to be ignored by mainstream politics because they don't benefit the people that have power, the people that have money, that have put their thumb on the scale as to controlling, you know, kind of what, uh, you know, how, how effectively democratic our society actually becomes. And again, when we talk about democratic, we mean small d democratic, um, not like the political party stuff. Okay, so new social movements and their counter institutional political tactics Right, like so for instance, like uh, civil disobedience being used in the civil rights movement, right? That it shows that we're still not liberated, meaning we're not, we haven't met the goal of the enlightenment, which was, you know, kind of really looking at things in a logical sense and actually giving people, you know, the, the real cry of enlightenment was, you know, um, brotherhood, right? Equity, uh, freedom. And if you have people that, you know, like for instance, in this day and age, um, saying, you know, that women shouldn't have control over whether they have children or not, or that trans youth shouldn't be able to receive gender affirming care, right? Things like that. When people protest that, when they fight back against it, when they bring these issues into the kind of larger political debate, it does show that the enlightenment work or the goals that were set out by the first enlightenment thinkers have still not been fully realized. We have not transformed into a fully fair and equitable society. So moving on to Habermas's theoretical orientation. So his theoretical system blends individualistic and collectivist levels of analysis to address concerns of individual agency and of social structures. And really he's exploring issues of rational and non-rational dimensions of social life. So really there's a multi-dimensional approach when it comes to rationality. This is evident in how he discusses it, meaning instrumental rationality, he refers to as the means or ends calculation 
that individuals use to optimize the benefits that are likely to happen from per pursuing a particular course of action. And so this entails a rational or technical approach to the social and physical world that asks how can a goal be achieved most efficiently. So Habermas's discussion of moral, practical rationality and aesthetic, expressive rationality speaks to the idea that sometimes the things that motivate us aren't just rational, right? They're coming from our morals, from what we consider to be more beautiful, right? From other non-rational motivating factors. Okay, and then communicative action is premised on the conviction that human emancipation is not possible as long as one form of reasoning dominates another. So in an ideal democratic society, according to Habermas, both rational and non-rational forms of reasoning would motivate an individual's actions. So Habermas contended that the distortion of consciousness that plagues modern individuals is the result of steering media of the economic and political systems. Remember the, the money and the power. And that that colonizing of the life world and its framework of shared meanings and norms are then affected when the life world is diminished. So economic and political systems operate according to their own impersonal logic that confronts individuals as an abstract amorphous force that largely defies their ability to control their own destinies, right? Kind of going back to that iron cage of bureaucracy that, that you know, they're leaning on some of these pre previous theorists. Um, and then, of course, modern society is ordered less by the ongoing negotiation of meanings Right? So it's not just about kind of what do you consider democracy, what do I consider democracy, right? which is what kind of made up the world of the past, but it's more about these structures that are shaping the natures of our social interactions. So in an individualistic dimension, you know, again, he's looking at both collectivist and individualist dimensions. And this is why it's really important to his theoretical arguments. So you know, the system integration and social integration, these two things he's talking about and his emphasis on the life world is really aimed at understanding the ways or even the distorted ways in which individuals construct their personal and their collective identities, how they negotiate meanings and, you know, through that process, how they create and recreate a social order in society. So the social orders produce and reproduce as individuals coordinate their actions through processes of reaching understanding mediated within the life world. Okay, so last up in this chapter, we get to talk a little bit about Patricia Hill Collins. Patricia Hill Collins is a very important thinker when it comes to applying some of these kind of notions of critical theory in a contemporary sense. So you know, she really noticed when she was teaching a course called The Black Woman to middle school girls in 1970, she came to realize that there was not only the shortage of teaching materials by and about black women, but also that that was pretty significant, the fact that there were not these educational resources available. And she started to think of, like, what does that mean for society? How does that you know, um, imbalance or, or lack, dearth of, of material really reflect the inequity in society and kind of show the need for more of these resources. So the exclusion of black women from intellectual discourses really became the subject of her first book, Black Feminist Thought, Knowledge, Consciousness, and the Politics of Empowerment, which won the Jesse Bernard Award of American Sociological Association for significant scholarship in gender, as well as the C. Wright Mills Award from the, from the Society for the Study of Social Problems. Whew, say that five times fast. So Collins illuminated the rich, self-defined intellectual tradition of black women, which she argues has persisted despite formal discursive exclusion. So in also fighting words, black women in the search for justice, she shows not only how elite discourses present a view of social reality, that elevates the ideas and actions of the highly educated white men as just normative or the baseline or as superior, but also how black feminist thought has remained dynamic and oppositional under changing social conditions. And then in black sexual politics, she firmly situates black feminist thought in the critical tradition by insisting that anti-racist African-American politics in the post-civil rights era has to also address issues of gender and sexuality, 
right? So it's interesting, even though she um, is not thought of as coining the term intersectionality, um, you know, Crenshaw based, you know, used her as a framework for developing that term, as we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so jumping in very briefly, and again, she's such an interesting person to go through. Wish we had more time for this. But anyway, um, so standpoint epistemology is really the philosophic viewpoint that what one knows is affected by their standpoint or their position that they have in society. And in this case, epistemology just means how we know what we know or how we decide what is valid knowledge. So basically, standpoint epistemology is concerned with the impact of a person's location in society on their ability to know things. For example, being gendered differently means men and women have different experiences, and those differences can inform their differing perspectives. So Collins argues that the critical phenomenological feminist ideas of people like Dorothy Smith and others really you know, that we need to focus more if we want to have a better understanding of the dimensions of society on the epistemological standpoint of black women and their perspectives and their experiences to better understand what has been excluded and how we've, you know, uh, positioned, you know, very wealthy white male thought as the norm. So coming from the standpoint of epistemology is the matrix of domination. This is one of those things, hopefully you've already heard of this, right? This should have come up in a sociology class before today. But if not, we're going through it. So basically the matrix of domination underscores that a person's place in society is made up of multiple contiguous standpoints rather than just one essentialist standpoint, right? So in contrast to early critical theorist accounts that assume that power operates from the top down, by forcing or controlling unwitting victims to bend to the will of more powerful superiors, this is more of an intersectional focus of, you know, understanding social marginalization in those, you know, as she, as she puts it, multiple contiguous standpoints rather than one essentialist standpoint. So our categories, our identities are, cre are connected. So again, Crenshaw built from Collins the idea of intersectionality. So the matrix of domination is really a way for people to acknowledge not just their oppressions in societies, but also their privileges, right? So for instance, in the matrix of domination, for a person like myself, I could say, well, I am privileged by race because I have a racial category that gives me more status, more credibility. Um, I don't have to deal with the same racial biases that a lot of people do, um, but you know, I could also say because of my gender identity, that is not privileged in a patriarchal society, right? That doesn't give me credibility. That doesn't give me power and status. So that you have to look at a person as the total sum of all of those contiguous parts to truly understand where they're at. And basically think of it like every hierarchy in society is a ladder. How many rungs up or down that ladder are you, right? But then when you start adding all those different ladders together, you start to see that people have radical different experiences of the same social phenomena, not just based on race, not just based on gender, not just based on social class, not just based on sexuality, not just based on age, not just based on ability or disability, but based on all of those things and more and many more, right? So anyway, she talks about how under the matrix of domination, there's this resistance of oppression that happens at three different levels. First, at the level of the personal biography. The second is at the level of group or community that's created by race, class, gender, or some of these other systemic levels of social institutions. And then the third is the level of the systemic of social institutions. So black feminist thought really reflects the interests and standpoints of its creators. Collins locates black feminist thought in the unique literary traditions forged by black women such as Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, Alice Walker, and also in the everyday experiences of ordinary black women and how they encounter situations in their lives based on those kind of societal hierarchies and the ways in which this gives them 
a way to see the world that other people don't see. So we can kind of go all the way back to when we talked about W.B. Du Bois and this notion of double consciousness, right? This idea of seeing through your own perspective, but also seeing through society's perspective that says that you're less than, right? If you're looking at, you know, someone's positionality as being a white woman, right? Being privileged by race means that they might have a blind spot for all the ways in which they are privileged and they have more power and status and opportunities than someone who doesn't, right? Versus someone who is more marginalized by race, like a black woman, is going to have not just a, a clear subaltern perspective on, you know, something like, like gender, but also race, right? That being the experience of being a black woman is different from being a white woman, is different from being a black man. And therefore, those com that kind of combined ex experiential knowledge is going to give a completely different standpoint that, again, is, is, you know, basically what she's saying is, this is incredibly necessary. How can we actually understand the dynamics of society if we're not looking at the ways in which people experience multiple oppressions or the ways in which people have different experiences in a more complicated way than one dimension? So when looking at multiple oppressions, black women particularly are vulnerable to dominant paradigms of knowledge. And it means that because they've been excluded, because they're not often reflected in the history books, especially not to the level in which they've contributed to that history, um, this means that some women are going to be more reliant on their own experiences than what they're just like reading in books or seeing on TV or film because for a lot of years that just wasn't there. Those perspectives are just not being raised to that level. So that black women come to voice and break the silence of oppression by drawing both from their experiences and from the collective secret knowledge generated by groups on either side of power. That is basically drawing from experiences from the black community as well as the black female community in particular. Okay, so when it coming to Collins' theoretical orientation, you know, she's looking at a self-defined standpoint which reflects agency at the level of the individual, right? It's not like how social systems do these things. That's how who we are and how those different identities we have overlap each other or come together, combine together to give us a particular standpoint on the world. So Collins maintains that she favors this term over Bell Hook's term self-reflexive speech because self-defined standpoint ties black women's speech communities much more closely to institutionalized power relations. So standpoint here refers to, and this is her quote, historically shared group-based experiences and that groups have a degree of permanence over time such that group realities transcend individual experiences. So this reflects a prioritization of a collective realm as well, right? So she's looking at a person's individual experiences, but also looking at how that lends to a collective view of society as some groups are privileged and some groups are not. So Collins readily acknowledges that the individual has unique experiences that are rooted in their own immutable social location. And this reflects their cognizance of the level of the individual, right? So this, this idea that, yes, the individual is very crucial here to developing this theoretical or orientation, right? And so, though, of course, Collins is still also looking at a more collective uh, view as well because she's looking at how those individual experiences can lead to more group based experiences or group based communities that can come together based on similarity of those unique experiences. So Collins theory really also looks at a collective rationalistic view of power characteristics. So connecting it back to some of these other critical theorists, right, that relations of power are perceived as pre existing the hierarchical structure external to the individual, and that it's that power relationship that then is reified in society and creates these differing lived experiences for people. 
So again, I wish we could get into this way more because there's so many fun examples coming from Collins' theoretical orientation, but hopefully she, Patricia Hill Collins is someone that you've already heard a bit more about than some of the other thinkers in this chapter. All right, that's it. That's the wrap of what we didn't get to in class. Hope this makes sense. Till the next time.